members senior three morning uh, once again we are grateful that we we are having this lesson uh, today is a, is a, is 24th of august that is 2021 and we thank allah that we are still alive <clears throat> and we are praying to him so much and so hard and uh, very much always that he grants blessings to us and our families and again he helps lift this kind of situation in which we are operating I would still encourage you to stay safe uh, to, to always observe the SOPs and above all you make sure that by the time when they are opening schools you come back um, in just one piece we are continuing with our discussion I, today i want us i want our lesson to be um, to be interactive i want our lesson to be interactive i'm going to be asking you members to, to ask as many questions as uh, as possible and uh, and uh, such that we can we can i can also try to to, to gauge how far you are moving with grasping these these things here because we might be teaching but again if you don't get response from you guys we cannot evaluate uh, what we have taught very well so i'm going to ask you to be i'm going to to to, to, to request you to be uh asking questions to the class to be interactive of course we have moved a very long uh, long way we've discussed much since the lockdown and uh, so far I think so good there were some some people who are having concerns that uh, what about East Africa I'd like to answer that and say to to, to be clear uh, we shall look at East Africa if you uh, basically if you if, if, if you come back because East Africa we still have uh, okay not a very small part but at least the part that we still have can be can be managed when you come back so given the fact that South Africa still has a lot to cover that's why we are having all our energies thrown back uh, behind South Africa such that we can try to cover as much as we can uh, in that by the time you come back we have uh, we have tremendously done something with the coverage of the syllabus I still want to make this clear and I still want to remind you that when you come back whatever we have covered members we shall not repeat it those who are not who have who have not afforded to be online you would be finding ways of how you'd be catching up you know trying to consult those that have basically attended these lessons we shall not be going back and we have covered a lot so it will not be um user friendly if we if we cover everything we have covered again so the notes that you have download them that we have uploaded make sure that you get them downloaded make sure that you, uh, you you can bind them okay it is very much important you can say that you keep them together you can bind them because you're not going to, to to copy them again actually don't 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 waste your energies and calories copying those notes don't copy them don't copy them you shall be using those notes um as the way they are when you come back they are the notes you will be you would be carrying around okay reading and revising and doing uh, whatever kind of other stuff you want to be doing so don't copy the notes make sure uh, that you have downloaded them you have printed them and you have them in the hard copy so that's why we are we're not neglecting east africa but simply we are trying to to focus so much on south africa we still because we still had a lot to cover in south africa and inshallah when you come back oh if you still if you find that we still have some time within this uh, uh, lockdown then we shall find a way of maybe how to throw in one or two uh, lessons or 
on East Africa. But ideally, the objective is, is with South Africa. Now, having made that clarity, I said I'm going to be, uh, the class is going to be interactive. I want to see comments here in, 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 in chats. Please, you, you talk to me. <coughs> you talk to me. I want to see the comments. And, uh, and then I try to, to say one or two things. Um, no one has posted yet. Um, seeing someone here, seeing some funny, funny stuff. Next time, next time, the is this one. I don't know, maybe these are okay. Senior three. Okay, I will be reading through the comments as 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 they come. But of course, whatever I'm seeing here is uh, these are the, they are all the comments. I want comments which are dated the twenty fourth. What I'm seeing, they are basically all the all the comments. Okay. So, today we are going to look at the time when we, we ended with the, uh, we ended with the, with this, uh, actually we are looking at, we are still looking at defensive states. If I can make a recap, we are still looking at defensive states and ideally what I'm looking at, uh, we are still looking at the Basuto nation. I told you, boy, you guys to Google about Lesotho and tell me. I want to see. I want to see you chat. I want to look at your chats when you are talking. Some you are saying something about the Soto. Um, so we said the nation is still even existent up to now, and we said in 1868 uh, the founder that is uh, Moshesh, 1868 the founder uh, found it important that of the two demons that were around, let me give my country to. To the British, that's what we say, okay? Because we had looked at the relationship between Moshesh and uh, and the whites, oh, and the Europeans. We looked at the, 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 the his relationship with the with the missionaries. These were from France. His relationship with the Boers, of course. These were uh, uh, the, the, the greedy Europeans who really wanted to to to, to take up land, uh, given any any sort of opportunity they could get. And of course, uh, using a force. And then we looked at his relationship with the British. We said with the, with the, with the British it was a mixture. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it was okay. And then the other times, of course, um, uh, that cannot be ruled out when it comes to, to statecraft. You can sometimes clash and then you sometimes you have some kind of working relationship. So it was a mixture of good and, uh, and then some kind of uh, destructive relationship but again after a long period of time and we say that it was a time of imperialism time of imperialism or colonialism in africa so chances were are minimal that his country would survive without being colonized so he realized that as i told you he was uh, he was uh, shrewd intelligent and he had that kind of a character that was supposed is supposed to be a true character of a king or of a leader of people. So now what he did that Machazi was faced with this kind of imperialism, at least he decided to say that let me give my country into the hands of the British, that is 1868, such that it can be under the protection of the British. That's what we ended at. And then we said, of course, after two years, 1870, uh, Moshe died of uh, old age. Died of old age, and he died a very happy man because he was sure <coughs> that his country was going to have continued. Now, I remember I also hinted on something that after <coughs> presenting his country to the British, what was the implication? Okay. Because it wasn't like I'm giving you my country and then you are going to be 
everything is going to be very okay. You know? It meant that when the British took over the protection of, of Basuto land, things were going to change. It was no longer now. Basically, basically the things that really changed and that had a profound effect was the, 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 the regulations. Okay? Call them regulations. Or you call them the laws governing people. The laws and regulations governing people changed. Because now it wasn't, yes, they were supposed to stay with their leaders. They stayed with the, their, that is the, the Basuto stayed with their local leaders. Okay? But of course, the local leaders and the, the subjects, they were supposed to be governed in line with the interests of the British. Okay? That was the implication of giving Basuto land to, to the British in 1868. Yes, they retained their identity as the Basuto people. They retained their lands. That was very good that uh, after, after 1868, now it, it was made clear that the Boers were no longer supposed to, well, I mean, actually, they could no longer encroach on the Basuto land because it had been gazetted as an area that was under the influence of the British. So their lands were safeguarded from being taken over by the British. But another thing that came along with the, the protection of the British were the changes in regulations and laws that were governing Basuto land. And what was the implication? The implication was that the Basuto were supposed to be governed by what we call the British laws, okay? The British laws, or the laws that were made by the British, basically to favor, to favor the interests, to favor the interests of the British, the interests of the British. That was the biggest, biggest implication. Now, if the laws were changed, not in, in favor of the Basuto people, but in favor of the protectors, that is the British, okay? The implication was that some, some laws, this is the implication, some laws were, were not, uh -huh. some laws were not, accommodative we are not accommodative of the basuto we are not accommodative of the basuto interests we are not accommodative of the basuto interests the regulations were changed and they were changed why they were changed to favor uh, uh, to favor the British interests. Of course, the duration is in the Basuto land. The duration is in the Basuto land to favor the interests of the British. Okay, at the expense. This is the expense. Uh huh. These ones were favored, and these ones, the favor was at the expense of. Of the of the Basuto land of the Basuto people, so we are saying that some laws we are not accommodative of the Basuto uh, interests of the Basuto interests. Now, much as the king had died a happy man, but of course what he did had some kind of uh, some kind of of challenges. I'm not seeing your, I'm not seeing feedback members. I don't know if you are there. I'd like to see if uh, um, I'm not seeing in the chat room. The chat the chat room is empty. This is senior three. Uh, I'm seeing uh, I'm still seeing those that we are 
l'eau de mort. Ok. So, since they are not accommodative of the basuto interests, uh huh. Now, this is like a cycle. Anglo basuto conflict. We are tracing the origin of the Anglo basuto conflict. And we are tracing it from 1868, uh -huh, when the British became the protectors. So they earmark regulations to fit their interests. But of course, some of the laws and regulations were not accommodative of the Basuto. Uh -huh. And among these regulations that were not accommodative of the Basuto, was the, there were many, of course. You cannot have laws and then you just have one law. Yeah? There were many laws that the British had uh, enacted to help them fulfill their interests in the Basuto land. But the most important of them was the law that concerned the gun. Was the law that concerned the gun. Okay? Members, I want to take note of that. I'm tracing for you the origin of the Anglo Basuto conflict of 1880. Ten years after Moshe had died. He died 1870. And then he had given his country to the British 1868. And after he had given his country to the British, uh, after they had occupied his country, oh, after they had undertaken the role of protecting his country, 12 years later, the Anglo, or the, the British and the Basuto, they developed a conflict. That's what we are tracing. That's what we are tracing, members. They are, a, a conflict developed between the British and the Basuto. And the conflict was basically not, not about land, ideally. Okay? That's why it was given, and the name that was given to it was all about a concern of the gun. There were many other laws, even the laws about land. Some of them were somehow oppressive about land. They were oppressive, but at least I think for them they were a bit bearable. But now when it came to the gun, the law concerning the gun, it led to the reaction. Okay? It was so oppressive. Uh -huh. Oppressive. The law about the gun was oppressive and uh, unwelcome. Unwelcome among the Basuto. It was oppressive and unwelcome among the Basuto. And the result, the result was a reaction. The result was a reaction from the Basuto people was a reaction from the Basuto people and what was the reaction? The reaction was a rebellion. The reaction was in the form of a rebellion. It wasn't a reaction like a, it was a collaboration. It wasn't a reaction in the form of a diplomacy, sitting and trying to talk about it. But the reaction was in the form of a rebellion. You can call it a war. You can call it a conflict. You can call it a resistance in 1880 and because it was having genesis from the laws concerning the gun actually what was what were the laws what was the law about the gun the law about the gun was none other than this armament okay it was made clear and it was stipulated by the british that all the basuto people who were owning guns we are supposed to be disarmed. So if it was the law about the gun, specifically concerning the gun, it was about disarmament. To disarm, it means that uh, uh, any kind of government in power, or you call it, you can call it any authority in power, they undertake the responsibility of removing ammunition and arms from people who are owning those arms illegally in what they refer to as being illegal possession of what of guns to the people who are being disarmed to them it might not be illegal actually 
owning the owning guns, it might be their right. <coughs> or owning weapons, it might be their right. But to those who are in authority, they can look at it as something being illegal and therefore they begin making efforts to remove guns or to remove weapons from from such people. Okay. Someone is asking here, please teacher, can you attach the notes, please? I think the notes you have them, they uploaded them sometime back. Um, that's what I can say. Unless when you want to you want them to be re uploaded. But the notes the now one says here, teacher, what is the meaning of Anglo? Uh, that is Dula Fahad. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know, Dula, you can tell me. Are you having the notes? Uh, uh, someone, Kauma Akram, says, I didn't see them. I'm dead. I also don't have the notes. They sent them two weeks back. Motesi, yes. The notes are there. Unless when you're asking us to reload them again, so where are the history notes? The notes are there. Um, but for those who are not seeing them, teacher, that situation of disarming guns is like that in Afghanistan. So we don't know. No. I'm going to tell you about what is an Afghanistan. Actually, you have, you, have, you have taken a look into my mind because I was going to say something about Afghanistan vis-a-vis -vis what is happening in Karamoja. So someone said, what is Anglo? Anglo means the British. Whenever you find the word Anglo, the anglo Boer War. I think we have looked at that. Oh, shall look at that. The anglo Boer War. The Anglo-Zulu conflict. Whenever you look at it, you see the word Anglo, it is none other than the British. Okay? Uh, so uh, that word should not confuse you. It is as simple as, uh, as that. Then secondly, someone asked about, um, was relating with disarmament, disarmament with what is happening in Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan, okay, what is happening in Afghanistan is uh, actually is taking over government by the Taliban, that's what is happening, <laughs> but you can't disarm the Taliban because even the Americans for 20 years they have failed to disarm them. This armament is what is happening in Karamoja today. Uh, it, is a, it has been a process that has been ongoing, oh, but that has been undertaken by our army called the UPDF, I think now like for 10 years. Okay? They have been trying to disarm the Karamojong because ideally you cannot separate the Karamojong from the gun. Is this um, no. Yeah, defense mistakes. Has to be consistent somewhere. So, <coughs> the UPDF in 10 years has tried to remove guns from the Karamajon. That's what we call disarmament. You try, sometimes it has used the force, sometimes it has talked to them, and then through their leaders, of course, they talk to those who are having guns and they surrender them peacefully. That has been, uh, of course, in some areas, it has been with a lot of resistance and uh, So it has been with a lot of resistance, and of course the UPDF has uh, had to use had to use force, whereby some of them, some of even UPDF soldiers, have lost lives in disarming the Karamajong. So the war of the gun is what we are going to look at. It was a law that about the gun, and it was basically that all the Basuto people should be, uh -huh, they, 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 they should be, they should lose their guns that by law, they were not supposed to, to have guns and it was only the reserve of the government, that is the British government at the Cape, to have guns such that they can keep law and order. Now, this was oppressive and unwelcome and of course, the, uh, it triggered what we call a reaction, the reaction which was in the form of a rebellion. So, given that background, that's why we have what we call the Anglo-Basuto conflict that happened 10 years after Moshesh uh, had died. Because you would, do, you would ask a question that if Moshesh 
thought that it was wise to give away his kingdom to the British. Uh -huh. Why then did they fight? I have told you. They only fought uh, basically that these, that is the British, introduced laws which were oppressive. <clears throat> but most importantly, the law that was very much oppressive was about, was concerning the law, was the law concerning the gun. And that was none other than uh, this armament law. So now this one here, uh, uh, confused and really uh, annoyed the Bastille so much that eventually they ended up uh, fighting against the British. Now, the, the, the other thing about this aspect here that it has, the topic has a number of names. Of course, first of all, we have called it the anglo basuto conflict. So when you find in a question, and it has this, uh, give the causes of the anglo basuto of course you have taken note of the year. The year is 1880, which is very much important. So whatever name that they try to give, as long as the year is consistent, then you would know that I'm going to be writing this kind of information. But of course the other names, they call it um, the war of the gun, war of the gun. Of course, I've given you the background as to why it was about the gun. War of the gun, 1880. And then sometimes they call it the disarmament, uh, disarmament war. Disarmament war, still 1880. All these are different names, and I have told you what disarmament means. Um, the war of the gun, what it means. Then the other time it is called the anglo basuto conflict. Then the other time it is called the Pussy, um, uh, the Pussy Rebellion. It is called uh, the Pussy Rebellion of 18 and 80. These are one, two, three, and four names. Just to look at the year, the year has to be very much consistent 1880, and then. It's a, it's a, if it is war, disarmament, policy, or anglo basuto, uh, then it means that that you are talking about the anglo zulu war. Of course, that is the background members of the war, and uh, I would like to thank those who have asked some one or two questions. I'm still waiting for more questions. I said this class is going to be. I want it to be interactive. Also, Google about Lesotho. I told you that time to Google about Lesotho. I want to, some feedback <coughs> from you, exactly what you have found about Lesotho as a country. Because I told you, what made Moshesh to die a satisfied man was the fact that he was sure that his country was going to have continuity. Okay? Uh, continuity. He was sure that his country was going to have continuity. And he was very right on that that the country has continued to exist even up today, and it is called the Soto. So, it was because of that that I asked you to Google uh, something about the Soto. Kingdoms like Zulu are not countries, okay? That, that is the funny thing about it. Kingdoms like Zulu are not countries. Um, kingdoms like, uh, like the Ndevere, these were all great kingdoms. Great king actually greater than than the Basuto nation, but they are not they are not countries. Okay? But Lesotho and Swaziland, Lesotho and Swaziland, which we are formed as a result of defensive states, these are independent. They are independent countries. So I want you to Google about Lesotho and tell me. About his about the president of Lesotho, you tell me about the capital, you tell me about uh, the people, about their step of food, anything you can, anything you can say about uh, about the country. I need that in the in the feedback that you would be giving me, and then we begin discussing about about that. I don't know if I have any any more query from you. Uh, I can make it clear. Yes, I told you, Anglo, don't get mixed up. It's all about uh, uh, the, the, the British. We've, we've had that even in, in East Africa. When you talk about Anglo, it is, uh, it is about the British. Okay. So having said that, 
I've given you a thorough background of uh, of the the war of the guns, or what we call the post uh, resistance. Now we are going to go through the causes of 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 the war, and then we shall look at the effects of the war, and of course why the Basuto were defeated. Because it is very hard to have a scenario whereby the the, the bridge lost to the Basuto. It, it is very hard, given the fact that uh, the, the other had everything at their disposal in terms of weapons that they could use to be to be fighting. I hope the notes have been uploaded, and you you. you, you, you you are able, you can you can be able to see them or we are going to upload them soon for those who are not seeing them you are going to get them and if if we do it this time please don't ask me again that is how you are not seeing the notes because we, we we already uploaded them some time back i don't know what happened they would have been there but at least if you get them please try to download them and get hard copy personal copy <coughs> for yourself so uh, in reduction, we have the anglo bastard conflict, 1880. Uh, to 81 is also known by the War of the Guns, Disarmament, or post Rebellion, or Basuto Resistance. They can even call it Basuto Resistance, by the way. Uh, uh, that's another fifth term they can use if they are setting it. It was fought between the British uh, of the Cape government and the Basuto, that is the Soto Kingdom. The Basuto were led by Chief Morosi. Uh, and let's see the which were led by Sir Gordon Spriggs the Cape Prime Minister it was fought in two phases i.e. the first phase 1878 and 79 under Chief Morosi uh, Puthi and the second phase 1888 under Rothordi so that is the brief background of the, what we are talking about here uh, given the name of Puthi because of the very very first leader Morosi Puthi that's why it is called because I know someone will example we are going to ask me why uh, the name the name Puthi it was a name of the chief that led the Basuto into the war. Yes, of course, uh, here. Mm. Okay, <laughs> someone Hamis Abdallah, but teacher did the Americans really try to stop the Taliban's cause let's not forget they funded the them twenty years back to help them stop the Soviet. They even invited them to America, but a few people got to know about it. Uh, anyways, what I'm saying, America never does anything without expecting something in return. So someone is, uh, is asking so much about a fan, then a step of food. Someone says, Likobe and uh, Motesi, capital city is Maselu. Thank you so much. Their prime minister is Dr. Motesi Majoro. Yeah, thank you so much that anything, everything you have done with the finding out that information. So that is the country. That is the country, small as it is. They are very much independent. But of course, it is a country of, of only a group of people called the Basotho or uh, the Basuto. We are trying to trace their history and of course how they became uh, very much uh, uh, an independent country as how they are today. Of course, through struggle and losing lives. Now these people struggled against the loss of guns and of course the causes were a number of them and he says here causes were long term and short term social and economic in nature as usual there are so many many other causes of course the, the cause concerning the guns it was the sparking cause it was the immediate cause but of course there were many many other kind of reasons as to why especially they happened to react in the way they reacted now he says here the desire to disarm the basuto of course was the immediate cause of the rebellion i've told you what to disarm means it is uh, making laws that are removing guns from your hands um if some people have held guns for so long it is very hard now it's like it's very hard to disarm the taliban someone is saying that the americans trained them yes they trained them they used them against the soviet uh, to fight, disintegrate what you used to call USSR, United Soviet um, uh, Socialist Republic. Uh, that was uh, that was then, and today it is in a, it is in the form of Russia. It was inclusive of many countries: uh, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Chechnya. There are so many 
Eastern Europe countries that are making a composition of what we call USSR. And of course, Americans funded all of the fighters that we are fighting against the USSR. Taliban is inclusive. But of course, they, they had trained them and they now, 20 years later, they can't do anything about the Taliban because the Taliban, first of all, they are a people of their own caliber. You cannot change them. The Taliban, as how he was a hundred years back, is the same Taliban as how he is today. You can't change them. You can tell them, you can teach them many things, but you cannot change the nature. They, I mean, that's why you see them, the way they put on, they are funny councils and what have you, but still, they can use guns effectively. They are very good in making bombs and making weapons. All of that cut us off the Americans. So, you cannot disarm them. The best you can do is to leave their country and they control their own country. And of course, they are, there might be a number of understandings they had with the Americans. Of course, the Americans could not just live like that and then they go. There has to be some kind of, uh, of understandings that we are reached which cannot be, which are confidential, of course. So, now, um, when we look at the causes, <clears throat> here we said the gun was the major cause. Then they refused the Basuto to surrender their guns. They desire to disarm the Basuto. Then, two, the refusal of the Basuto to surrender their guns, <coughs> of course, caused the war. As I have told you, that when you go to Karamoja region, they have the gun. That's why they even have a. They are very, they are very sharp in shooting. You talk about the Karamojo because as Ali, as 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 five years, a kid is holding an AK-47. By the time he makes fifteen years, he can shoot on a target one man, one bullet. They don't waste the bullets because they don't have many of them. So, it is very hard. To, it was very hard for the UPDF to disarm the. And still, have, even up today, some of the Karamojo still have guns. So that is disarmament. Teacher, that situation of disarming guns is like, um, mm -hmm. sir, is Angulo Basuto the same as Basuto? I don't know what you are asking here. Angulo Basuto is two words in one. Angulo Basuto, uh, these are two words in one. Then Basuto <coughs> is just one word. But what the, so the meaning is that, Anglo Basuto, these are two groups of people, British and the Basuto. And then the Basuto alone is just the Basuto people alone. So that is the difference. Um, and then three, the, the rise of social leaders. Uh, leaders Morosi and Jerothodi also caused the rebellion since they inspired their subjects to fight. That is another point. The presence of the guns among the Basuto gave them, given by the Boers, uh, and the British gave them confidence to resist. The death of Moshesh, a great diplomat, opened the Basuto state to white rights leading to the outbreak of the war. Uh -huh. Then the need by the Sotho to defend their independence led to the outbreak of the post resistance because they thought when you move, of course they first they had accepted. But now when it came to removing a gun from them, it meant that now we were coming after their own own independence. So they reacted, said, no, these guys here, after taking away our gun, they are going to take away our independence. So they reacted. Briefly, members, that is the real background of what we call the Anglo Basuto uh, resistance. Uh -huh. so someone says, Sebu Yondo, um, how comes it is a country, yet yeah, it is in South Africa? <laughs> I've already I said, teacher, explain. I have already told you, <clears throat> of course, when they are making countries, that was an arrangement of the, of the colonizers, okay? It was an arrangement of the corner, depending on their understandings. As I told you, it is an independent country, but it is within South Africa. It was an arrangement of the British. It was an arrangement of the British. Of course, when you look at the Basuto, uh, uh, they, 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 they had their own cultures, cultures very distinct, they had uh, their uh, leaders, uh -huh, which were very distinct, and even geographically, even geographically, uh, their, their kingdom is situated on Hile, on mountainous uh, Hile, Hile areas. 
of South Africa in in South Africa. Okay, I think to the British, it was a fit that these guys here would be given uh, independence, would be given uh, full control of their of their of their own country. Besides, it also became independent that due to the fact that when it came to to the apartheid regime in South Africa. Now, this was the real factor. Apartheid regime, you are going to look at apartheid in South Africa. After the apartheid regime in South Africa, okay, it was a, a regime that was a mixture of the Boers, that was a mixture of the Boers and the British. Of course, the British never liked the apartheid regime. The apartheid policies and apartheid laws, they never liked them. But because they wanted to end the conflict and the clashes between them and the Boers, they decided to give in to the racist policies that were being used by the Boers. So they gave in to the racist policies and they said, okay, uh, let us go ahead with whatever policies you have and we form a government for the common interest of the white communities in South Africa. So they gave in to the... But this kind of... Because the British were the ones who had taken protection of the Basuto, okay, it meant that Basuto land wasn't an affair of the Boers and the British. Much as South Africa, the rest of South Africa was an affair of the Boers and the British, Basuto land wasn't an affair of both. It was an affair of only the what? The British. Therefore, whatever was happening in Basuto land was very much different from what was happening in the rest of South Africa. Are you together? I hope you are together. I'm trying to explain the genesis. Why Basuto is independent, yet it is within South Africa. The British never, actually, they, they could not get their, their, their territory and then add it up with whatever they were sharing with the Boers. Okay? They remained, they said, uh -uh, Basuto land is ours. <clears throat> And whatever was happening in Basuland was their own kind of affair. The same applies to Swaziland. Whatever was happening in Swaziland was an affair exclusively of the British, without the influence of the Boers. But whatever was happening elsewhere in South Africa was an affair of the two parties, the Boers and the British. That's why South Africa, the rest of South Africa, I mean, that's why the Basuto land and Swaziland are independent much as they are within the, the confines of South Africa as a country. These were purely uh, concerns of the British, okay? And when it came to giving independence, Lesotho became independent before South Africa gaining what? Independence. Google and find out when Lesotho got an independence because as far as they can remember, South Africa became independent in 1994. If I can remember very well, when Lesotho and Swaziland had already got their own independence because the British for them, they were willing to give. Now, when they gave the, the Basuto their own independence, now it became an independent country, much as the rest of South Africa was not independent. Okay, that's why it was their, their independent countries, but within South Africa. And that arrangement cannot be changed. They are independent, they are independent. Okay, that's the reason behind. So, uh, back to the causes, we talk about uh, the undermining of African leaders. Of course, the causes are, are, are almost the same as how it is elsewhere. But most importantly, we have to take a note of the times when the rebellion took place. We have to take, we have to take a note of the party players. We said that it was between the Basuto and the British. Of course, the British being led by their prime minister. The name is there, and of course, the Basuto being led by their leaders. First of all, Morosi, and then later on, the Thorodi uh, in 1880. You take note of those things. And then the, the, the causes, uh, the, their grievances, their grievances, and basically the grievances um, uh, emanating from aspects like oppression, aspects like um, control of resources. Uh -huh. You are chasing Africans from their resources, that is land. Yet it is their land, you know. You, you're finding them on their land and then you try to make oppressive laws. And, and yet they are supposed to be free and you know, comfortable within their own. So 
the causes are rotating around oppression and the uncomfortable kind of uh, treatment that was emitted from the Europeans towards the Africans. Then 1871, British annexation of the Cape was hated by the Sotho, hence leading to the rebellion, the earlier burst of victory, motivated them, undermining of African leaders, the arrest of Morosi's uh, on accusation that he had stolen a gun, and the horse also caused the war, that was the leader. If you could accuse a leader of stealing a gun, it was very much uh, delegatory and undermining. The British opening of South, Southern Lesotho to white settlement was hated by the Africans, loss of land by the Basuto, uh, forced labor, undermining African cultures, and so, and so on and so on. You can read through them. I think the notes have been uploaded. I'm not seeing any response here that is telling me that we are seeing the notes. Are you seeing the notes? If you are seeing them, please download them and get me... Uh, help me, I uh, say that I get those who are having queries about the notes, please. I want to see comments here that now we are seeing the notes because you had lodged the complaints earlier on. Um, someone says, um, in my chat, someone says, Are we copying all the notes pinned on the lessons? I said no. Say the note, don't copy the notes. Now, effects of the war, just print them out and just have your own uh, personal copy. Effects, uh, both positive and negative, as shown below, the which were defeated and committed by the Sotho. Now, that was in the first encounter. Then, two, the which accepted to offer protection to the Basuta against their enemies. The which independence, the Basuta independence was preserved as a result of the war. The Basuta were all allowed to keep their guns, but they were to register them. Okay, they were very good. Some kind of um, uh, of of effects of the war. They were allowed to keep their guns. They were led to paralyzing of the economic activities like agriculture and the trade. Uh, of course, trade has been a spell to power and change it. Um, outbreak of famine uh, caused a lot of poverty to the Sotho due to loss of cattle. Uh, resulted into displacement of Basuto. The war emanated the end to killing of the Basuto ring leaders like Morosi and the Thorodi. Uh -huh. That is, they were, they were killed by the British. <coughs> and um, they all increased the British nationalism. Of course, what we call by we mean by nationalism, that is the, the increased the desire of... Uh, the, the, that, that sensitivity, you always have nationalism. Okay? Nationalism, uh, that is sensitivity sensitivity in form of uh, desire in form of a desire stroke love for one's country stroke love for one's country so you develop that love for your country that you can die for your country you can do anything for your country uh, that's what we call nationalism you become a nationalist, you become a patriot, you, uh, a patriot. So that love, that so um, it increased their the, the, the love for of the Basuto had for their land, the to be Basuto land. The British gave money to Basuto for rehabilitating their economy. The war caused a lot of suffering and misery to the people of the in the Basuto land, and so on. And so that were some of the effects of the war. And now factors for the success of the Basuto. Uh, <clears throat> Many factors made the Basuto successful in this war. The use of defensive positions in the Basuto nation, like the hills of Buthabuthe and Thababusi, led to their success. The social theses were large to accommodate many people for protection, thus leading to their victory. The Basuto knowledge about the use of the gun uh, led to their success over the which They also had experience and skills detained after fighting the Kolana and the, the Gulika. Their early victory in the British 1870 motivated them to fight, hence achieving success. The long period of peace and security created by Moshesh made the social nation strong, thus defeating the British. So the unity, so those are the factors that made the British, I mean the Basuto successful against the, 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 the British. Okay? Successful not, not, not the fact that they, they chased the British out of their country. So when we talk about success, it wasn't that they fought and completely chased the witch out of their country. Okay? It was uh, 
uh, it was successful in the fact that the British were able to recognize their interests. Okay, that's what we mean by successful. That the perspective of successful when it comes to what we call the Anglo Basuto War. Note that they were able to defeat and then chest the enemies, the enemy out of their country, but basically because they were able to get that kind of uh, good working relationships. I mean, relationship with the with the British. Eh? We say these days, uh, uh, the British, but and Kukubala Bawo, unlike in the earlier ones when they were they could mistreat them and when they could uh, they could look at them as being as being uh, uh, as being simply subjects without any kind of uh, any kind of essence so they became successful to uh, in, in in the way that now they could <clears throat> at least their voices could be heard and what does what did this imply the implication was that um, they retained their guns, okay, that was a success, they retained their guns, but the condition was that whoever was to retain a gun was supposed to register that what? That, that was okay, you know, other than completely disarming you, okay, let me retain my gun, but even when, it, if it's registering it, it's okay. So, even those conditions of registering were not done by the Basuto, but they were done by the British, meaning that they did not chase the British away completely, but of course, they were able to get their voice heard by those who were uh, who were regarding them as a, as a, their protectorate. The factors that made them successful are these ones that we are looking at here. The knowledge they had about the gun, they had enjoyed peace. Therefore, they knew exactly what it meant to be peaceful and independent under Moshesh. So that's why they were very much determined to fight. Then you talk about their leaders. Uh, their leaders were courageous, strong unity that was forged by the Moshesh. Their leaders were courageous, of course, to lead them. And anything to, to, be, to be successful, it has to be under strong kind of leadership. If you don't, you don't if you're not a good leader, you cannot, you cannot uh, get people to first of all believe in you, and then fight for your cause. You can't earn that. But if leadership is good, then you can get that. And the end of the day become successful so he talks about the social use of gorilla war tactics now the gorilla is you hit and run it is very hard to win a war if your enemy is fighting uh, gorilla tactics uh -huh. it is very hard to win uh, to win to, to win that war so and of course when it comes to fighting if, if when it comes to people loving their countries and really fighting for the survival of their countries, people pay the price of only one currency. That is life. Of course, you are going to be fighting for your for, for, for your country or for independence. The currency you used to pay eh, is not in the, you cannot buy, it is very hard to buy, uh, to buy independence from an oppressor. Most of the time, the currency you have to pay is life. You sacrifice people, such that the, the generation is to come can get to have uh, uh, some kind of, of good life. That's what happened with Churchill. Eh? Uh, Churchill, this is, was the guy who said Uganda is a part of Africa. You Google Churchill there. You have, you have your phones, you Google Churchill. He, he was a British Prime Minister, and he's the person who said that Uganda is the pearl of Africa, uh, something that we have banked on even up today, okay, that when, when you talk, when, when you talk about Uganda, when you go to those countries, you, you add that, that, uh, that slogan, but the slogan was given by none other than Winston Churchill, who was, uh, what do I want to say about him, that when it comes to defending, uh, to defending uh, independence and countries, people and leaders get so much determined that they pay with lives. When the Germans were bombing Britain so much in the Second World War, because by then the Germans had sophisticated uh, technology in terms of making warplanes, they were, 
they were beyond any other country except USA. But in a European country, they were beyond the, they were beyond any other country. So uh, Adolf Hitler had ordered that they intensify the bombing of Britain so much because Britain was the epicenter of all other nations that were fighting against Germany. So the tactic was that bomb the epicenter completely and then you are going to weaken the enemy. Now what Churchill did, because the bombing was so much, and I'm trying to show you that people can go uh, a milestone to defend their country, what he did, he ordered, because of course their planes could not rise against the planes of the Germans. There were so many in, 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 in their sky to the extent that they could not do, they could not shoot them from the ground. So what he did to, to safeguard his country, he ordered his pilots, okay, to fly their planes and and they crash the, the, the German planes. So he ordered them, you fly the planes, you go into space and you make sure, I don't know if I can call it to knock or, uh, and you make sure you crash the German planes. So they could move, they could fly the, the British planes, not basically to, to bomb the German planes, but basically to, 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 to knock them, and then the crashes. So these guys who are knocking them, they were young pilots, of course, but whenever you could crash a plane, it meant that you had to die within that plane. So many of them died. But he gave that order as a suicide order, saying that he can protect Britain as well. As a, so that is Churchill. So people who always pay, if they if it comes to defend their countries, that is in case if you love your country. Um, then the, another success was the final withdrawal of the British troops and the acceptance of the peace treaty in 1881 led to the success of the Basuto. The British said, "Okay, there's no need as why we should be fighting um, uh, this small country. Let us withdraw our." Basically, over the summer men, let them stay with their guns, and then um, if they stay with their guns, you make them to get those guns registered, and that would be uh, would be so simple. And also control the way these guys here we are buying, we are accessing guns. So that's how they were able to um, to be successful. That the British accepted to withdraw finally, and then it led to their success. Um, someone says, can you use the discussion room because I want to ask questions while speaking. Uh, I don't know if I have that discussion room here. Uh, I think Mr. Sekide is going to... We can use it, I think I'm seeing it here. Mr. Sekide is preparing it. So if you have a question, you can... Uh, You can ask, I think I will get it. So, that is the end of what we call uh, the Basuto land or the Basuto nation. That's why I was saying that if you have, if you have questions, ask them concerning the Basuto land. Um, you ask them before, before we leave, before we leave this defensive state. I, I told you that we are going to be having um, two case studies we are in the chat. Um, you can you can ask. Sebu Yondo, Alex. Sebu Yondo, Alex. Sebu Yondo. Sebu Yondo, are you there? I know you are there, but we are already in the chat. I don't know what takes for you to be in the chat. In the chat, I'm seeing Ramadan. We are having Ramadan. Ramadan. Then to there's to see me Fahad in the chat. So we are not in the chat yet. Yet you have the question. Discussion room. We are having so far four people. And. Uh, Kabiga, Ramadan, to see me. So we only go to the chat. That is if you, because we wanted to, to, to ask a question. Unless when you are off. 
So, um, I would still entertain some more questions about the Basuto land uh, because uh, we, we, we are done with that. And then we are going to look at another case study of the defensive state. And that is none other than the Swazi nation. Microphone appears to his microphone. Where is Sewiolo? Can you ask your question, please? Is he there? Hello. Yes, Sewiolo. Morning. Um, how did you? Morning. Hey. Yeah. How did you ask you? Uh -huh. In South Africa, there are some like in the South Uh huh. I say other states like this. Yes, so we have. Is, mm -hmm. it's, it's a country within, within South Africa. Mm. So, are there other enclaves, states like that? You check, you check on. Uh, I hope you are on the internet. Eh? You check on a country yes. called Swaziland. Swaziland? Uh huh. But that is called Eswatini. You Google Eswatini. Because they changed its name. Johannesburg is just a city in South Africa. So we all know. Yes. Johannesburg, you're asking about Johannesburg? Yes. Johannesburg is just a city like how Pretoria is, like how Cape Town is. Those are just very big cities in South Africa. Like how Durban is in Natal. They are just cities. But of course Johannesburg is a is a city whereby we find many, many black Africans. So beyond, are you with me? Another question. Those who want to ask should go to the chat room. Mm. So beyond, are you there? What have you found out about Swaziland? So beyond. Why is he going to give us a Thank you. Okay. Should we get Amina? No, should we get Amina and see the thing? Should we get Amina? Uh huh. So we all know. Uh huh. Is Swatini. Is it a Swatini? A Swatini? Is it right? Yeah. A Swatini, uh huh. What have you found? Officially, the kingdom of Is Swatini. Uh huh. Is Swatini. And formerly, formerly, Swaziland. still commonly known as Swaziland. Uh -huh. Officially named in 2018, mm. and it's landlocked country of South Africa. Aha, uh -huh. it is found within South Africa, right? Yes, it is bordered by. It's bordered by Mozambique. Uh -huh. To the its north, north east, uh -huh. the Swatini. Mm. And then South Africa? It is bordered by Mozambique. To and it's northern northeast. And, and then South Africa. And South Africa. Northwest and south. Uh-huh. So it is bordered by how many countries? Yes. It is bordered by how many countries? Those are two countries, right? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay, it is just having that outlet to with the Mozambique, but the biggest chunk of the, of the borders uh, she shares it with South Africa. Okay, so that is one like of the other country we can say that is within the enclave of South Africa as a country. Okay. Okay, you are off, I think. So, um, so we are having those two countries. We are having uh, Lesotho. Lesotho is within South Africa completely, enclaved in South Africa, and then the other one is is, is Swaziland. It has a simple outlet with Mozambique, but again, the biggest uh, the biggest part is bordered by by South Africa. Okay, thank you so much, Sebuyondo. And um, I can't we use the discussion because I want to ask. Okay, local name is Eswatini, um, Swaziland gained independence on 6th September 1968. 
So, six, nice. six, to eight. six to eight. Now that answers the fact that we now because Swaziland and Lesotho we are a concern of, Brit, of the British alone, without the influence of uh, without the influence of the Boers. That's why these two countries here in South Africa, they are countries, they are independent what countries that the policies they were using. In Swaziland and Lesotho, we are very much different from the policies that we are being used in the rest of South Africa. The rest of South Africa, which was uh -huh, under the influence of two European countries, or of two groups of Europeans, that is the British and the Boers. So, for the British, they were like elsewhere in, in Africa. For them, they were, they were a bit accommodative and they were a bit very much flexible. And... Uh, they were not after uh, completely uh, erasing the cultures of Africans. They could live the, 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 the chiefs intact, they could live with, with your cultures, but of course they wanted you to, to lead, uh -huh, use the regulations that were consistent with their interests. So now when time came, like when colonialism was no longer uh, a fashion in many countries in Africa, they gave Swaziland and Lesotho their independence because that was land which was under their own influence they gave them their independence and then because south africa the rest of south africa was under the influence of the apartheid regime the apartheid regime which was mainly composed of the boers actually the apartheid regime was mainly a composition of the boers it was so much influenced by the boers and all these racist policies so the rest of South Africa remained, uh, remained under the leadership of the, of the Boers and, and the British. So these two countries were given independence and that's why they are independent countries within, within South Africa. Okay, now um, we are supposed to be ending at, 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 at 10.30 and when I look at my watch we have 20 minutes. We are going to introduce ourselves to... I wanted to entertain more questions uh, from you guys before I go because I have uh, less time to uh, to switch to, <coughs> to, the, to the other defensive state. Under the Swazi nation, we are going to look at uh, aspects like uh, organization, factors for the rise of the Swazi and growth of the Swazi. We shall look at organization of the Swazi nation. Uh, of course, political, social and economic. We are going to look at... Um, uh, strong leaders like Zobuza, the first, okay, like how we have looked at Moshesh uh, uh, as regards the, uh, the the Basuto people. We are going to look at someone says here, teacher, uh, how long did Nelson Mandela fight apartheid? Okay, still Sewion is asking, he's taking us to the apartheid now. Um, apartheid policy. It, is, it, it, it has a long kind of history. When I say for how long, I will tell you that Mandela began fighting apartheid um, because ANC, I think ANC, ANC as a party was formed, I think, in 1912. And remember, um, Mandela was part of those that earlier uh, council that helped in the in the formation of the ANC. But the real, the real kind of fighting against apartheid, his prominence began to be sounded in the year of 1950 to the year uh, uh, 1950 and 1952. Now, since this time here, 1950 1952, until 1991, when he was released from jail, those are the years that he was fighting against what? Against apartheid. Meaning that he gave all his youth and career, sacrificed all his youth and career and all his energies to one thing, fighting against what? Against apartheid in South Africa. And God was on his side because Mandela, as I have told you, you cannot be a leader unless when you have some kind of royalty, okay? All of these people, you see the nation builders, you talk about Shaka. Shaka, much as he was an illegitimate son, but he was a son of a chief, Senzanga Kona. That's what I mean, royalty. 
when you talk about Moshesh, which we have just discussed here, much as he was his his father was a minor, but he was a chief of the Kweni of the Kweni people. Uh -huh. And then being a chief, he gave birth to a son called Moshesh. So meaning that Moshesh has sons some kind of royalty. So I think when trying to trust people who are going, who make things happen in terms of leadership, in terms of changing the political atmosphere, most importantly, yes, some of them can come from uh, from normal, normal, or even poor, very poor backgrounds. But most of them, when you trace back to their lineages, they have some kind of reality or some kind of leadership in their in their lineage. The same applied to to Nelson Mandela. He also he was also a son of a chief was the son of a chief and that's why and that's why he was able to get education and that's why he was able to get education <laughs> besides if he wasn't the son of a chief actually chances were very high that he will not get education at all but because he was son of a chief he was able to get education and he, i mean he grew up from from they were not very big palaces the small palaces but of course influential much as they were small but influential within the setup of the local of the local people and then he was able to get education and with the education he was empowered and he then he began standing against what we call against what we call uh, the apartheid regime in south africa challenging europeans and those those europe those white people in south africa in different angles both intellectually and even when it came to uh, to combat fighting, of course, we shall not look at we are look at we shall look at apartheid policy, um, trace its origins. Uh, of course, we also look at its devastating effects on the people of South Africa, and how it was finally ended. Reasons for for for, for the ending of apartheid regime in South Africa. So. So we wonder if I'm trying to answer you how long did Nelson Mandela fight apartheid regime just to count the years from 1950 to 1991 because 1991 he was released from jail and then he began he embarked on a policy of trying to to reconcile of trying to 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 to, to, to work out a way of how they could relate with the whites because his his objective was non-violence he didn't want to to, to fight because he knew that when Africans continue having that kind of rage, that kind of desire to fight, they were going to be the losers. Of course, they never had weapons, and what we are fighting was a government which had money, which had weapons, which had everything. So they were going to give them a chance to be killed. So he was released, and then he worked on that policy of uh, reconciliation between the whites and the Africans, and that's why they were able to to declare South Africa independent in 1994 when Mandela became uh, the first president of what? Of South Africa. Of course, it was jubilation and happiness to not only South Africans, but even to other countries, uh, many countries in the world, Uganda inclusive, because we, we, we helped them to train their fighters here in Uganda. That is under our own president, Museveni, Yoweri Kaguta. And they trained in that area of Changkwans. And after training, they went back to South Africa and caused some kind of uh, some kind of busy time to the to the apartheid regime. Then, um, if there are no more questions, I we, we we look at the Swazi nation. I said we are going to look at factors for the rise. We are going to look at um, arrange. I mean, organization of of the nation then we shall look at um, the, the, their nation builder that was uh, Zobuza the first today it is being led by a man called King Moswati and they are having challenges um, I don't know how far I've taken time to look at how far because uh, uh, some some two weeks or three weeks but actually maybe even a month the, 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 the Swazi people were rioting against the, their king, that is uh, King Moswati, saying that they are not having, they are not having enough control, uh, they are not having enough kind of uh, uh, control in terms of the, 
the, the, the way their country is being governed and the resources of their country, uh, the way they are being governed. Because uh, being the king, the king is the king. He does everything at will. And they were claiming that let us have what we call a monarchical, uh, uh, let us have what we call a monarchical government. And I mean, a, 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 a government, much as it is a government of a monarchy, but at least let it have uh, a substantive parliament, and then we get to have what we call laws and regulations that are pertaining to people, not much as not being influenced by the king and one person alone. So they had some kind of resistances, and I think probably have worked against, uh, I mean, worked um, on them. So, um, Swaziland, it is also a multi ethnic eth society that came to exist during the Great Mufekane period. So it was another defensive state. It earned its name from one of the greatest king called the Moswati. Uh, it was founded by Zobuza, who was the chief of the Ngwane clan of the northern Ndwandre tribe. Uh, due to land shortages, there was a war between Ndwandre and Azwide and Ngwane and Zobuza. The Ngwane were defeated and were led by Zobuza to central parts of northern Swaziland. The leading people in Swaziland in the 16th, 16th century were Yankosi, Lamini clan of the Nguni. They had gained control over neighboring Nguni and Sotho people. Zobuza the first who ruled 1814 to 1840 led to the growth of the nation. But this time, more clans joined the kingdom. Refugee groups from Zulu regiments found security in the mountains and the caves of the Swaziland and they promised to be loyal to Zobuza in exchange of their safety. So, it was also formed as a result of people who were fleeing from from oppression and from the the destructive elements of Mofekane, like how Lesotho was formed. You look at factors uh, for the rise and organization of Swaziland. Uh, of course, we have we have said it was formed as a result of the clash between the Zwide uh, and the Zobuza, and of course, Zobuza um, uh, had to move. And then when he moved, he formed a, a, a strong kingdom that stood very firm to defend, to defend the independence of its people. And then the factors, incorporation of smaller people, existence of few succession disputes, the presence of highly organized and efficient government, uh, rise the presence of leaders like Zobuza, Muswati, a very bit of strong standing army, you know, so you look at all those factors and then of course they are just straightforward and you can make use of you can make sense out of them organization um uh organization is political of course it was a kingdom a kingdom always i told you they are centralized the king they are they, they are always centralized of course the leader has to be the king then the swazi kings were given a title of Nguanyama and had absolute powers uh -huh. So Nguanyama is like the Kabaka here, like a title here we have the Kabaka. The king we advised and assisted by a small council called the Koko, uh, so on and so forth. So that is the political, then the social, the source participated in polygamy and their wives never came from Nkozi Lamini clan. The king was the central figure among the Swazi, the religious affair and so on. So the Swazi were divided into clans. So that is the brief organization of the Swazi as a kingdom or as another as another defensive defensive state and then you look at how Zobuza managed to build a strong Swazina, uh, Swazin nation you look at those factors um, then you talk about here changes introduced by King Moswati the first uh, took on administration of the Swazi kingdom 1840 established himself as a great leader of Ungwane king Leader Ngwane, uh, then he gave his name to the Ngwane society as the people of Moswati. So it, 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 was, it was King Moswati the first who gave that name to, 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 to the, the, the name Swazi to the kingdom and to his people. Okay? He gave his name to the Ngwane society as the people of Moswati. 
Okay, so that's how they came to be called the Swazi, from the name Moswati. During his time, the king became the leader, and the annual ceremonies in Kuala the royal villages were created in state, in the state, and they were under the royal wives. The queen mother became the most powerful political figure in the state next to the king. The king had responsibility with the national council. Uh, had during the then Siswati language became the commonest language among the clans and the Nguni tribe during the Maswati's regime. He had the Swazi boundary far to differ in power, but Maswati also militarized the kingdom. And so, so, and so uh, when we talk about the nation builders of the Swazi, we have two. We have Zobuza, who was the founder, and then uh, King Maswati, who was uh, responsible for, for forging Swaziland into what we are seeing today. So, uh, ideally, that brings us to the end of what we call the defensive, uh, the defensive states. I've just gone through this. Um, I've gone, I've gone through the the, the, the Swazi nation uh, very fast because I think you can, you can read them and uh, they are easy. You can they can make sense. So, uh, thank you so much for those who have been uh, present. For today's for today's lesson, I've not seen many questions. I don't know if I don't have uh, many people who are attending. But those who have attended, uh, uh, thank you so much. And um, inshallah, when we meet next time, I don't know. I'm going to discuss with my head of department. Either we come with East Africa, or when we meet again with South Africa, then we shall come to look at the aspect of missionaries in South Africa. Then for missionaries, we shall then straight go. To what we call mineral discovery in in South Africa, we still have a lot to cover in South Africa. That's why we are so much uh, spending a lot of time on coverage of South Africa. So uh, that's it from today. I wish you uh, the best. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.